God is doing amazing things on planet Earth at the moment. I believe that he's getting us ready for an amazing uh, revival. And what we've got to be careful of is that we don't lose heart. We don't sort of let negative, negativities get around our lives. We don't allow the enemy's plan. Because as we look at the world, as we look at the church even, as we look around, we're, we're not really seeing what we'd like to see. Is, could I, is, that, is that okay? How many people want to see more? How many believe that there should be more? And, and you know, we want to see signs and wonders and miracles and, and people be in touch. But, but there's also, I believe that in the Father's heart, is that he wants people to, to have that understanding and relationship with him. It's not a matter of coming to church. Church is not a building, but it's a bunch of called out people that have been called for a purpose to be able to show forth the presence of God. So Father, I ask you today that you'd help us to, to make that transition and, and Lord, keep our eyes on you and not allow the, the things of this world to, to, to get around us and, and everything like that. But Lord, just keep focused and keep our hearts open for what you want to do in us and keep hearing that still small voice and Father, we'll give you all the praise and we'll give you all the glory. I was thinking, David, while you're doing the communion there, when you said that, they, you know, that the graves are open and people that have been dead for 200 years went back, but nobody would know them. <laughs> they say, oh, I'm Fred. They say, who? I don't know you. But the only people that would know each other were the other ones that have been dead for 200 years too. Oh, good day, Fred. <laughs> Oh, dear. I just had a bad surprise this morning and uh, I thought that uh, it was a rainwater that was shrinking my shirts. And uh, I was going to say to Nance, don't wash my shirts in that rainwater because there's something happening. And uh, until I got on the scales this morning and found out that I've, that I've put on four kilos since Rocky's been here, Eh? I should have been running with Rocky. It's okay, he used to run about 10 mile every day, uh, but I wasn't doing that. But I, I remember one day I sat down with some people and I, that really encouraged me to go on a diet. As I sat on, and as I sat down, the pressure of my stomach pushed a button and I hit a woman about 10 feet away. <laughs> 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 But anyhow, I don't know what that's got to do with the price. I got the shock of my life. And then another day I went up to speak to a pregnant lady and our bellies hit before I got nearer. So, so I've got lots of things where God talks to me and teaches me and tells me it's time to go on a diet. So time to go on another diet. Amen. How many people know that Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever? The same Jesus is the same God, is the same Everything, everything, everything's the same. And you know, this, today as we, God looks down at the world, nothing really surprises him. Is is not saying, oh, that's happening. Let me just remind you of something here in one Corinthians chapter ten. It says, moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All ate the, drink, the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Jesus has always been around. His presence has always been with people. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. For their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples. There's so much in this in the Bible, and, and I'm not really didn't want to preach on this particular thing today, but I want us to be aware, and I'd love for you to read this these scriptures and just see the way of man and the enemy's plan to take people away from the things of God. These people were all there, they saw the miracles, they 
They ate the manna. They, they, they drank the water in the desert. They saw the mighty manifestation of God. They were brought out of bondage. Their, their clothes didn't wear out. There was a, just an amazing presence of God, the, the cloud of fire, the, 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 sorry, the pillar of fire, the cloud that protected them of a, of a day. But you see, if we allow wrong thinking and stuff to get inside us, It'll take us away from where God is and it'll even lead us into destruction. See, when we're born again, an amazing transformation begins to take place in our lives. We've got to understand that. It's like a spiritual awakening. I don't know about you, but something happens when you get born again. When I got born again, I was 27 years of age. I lived according to the flesh, because that's all I knew. I didn't know anything else. If anybody hurt me, I wanted to hurt them. I wanted the best of everything, and everything went that way. Well, see, when I got born again, that activated something on the inside of me it, it was a whole new way of living that my natural mind could not comprehend. There was a war going on. See, if we're not aware of this process or this transformation that God's wanting to do in our lives, our flesh man will fight what God's wanting to do. Find here that these people, they all, all had the presence of God, but God was not well pleased. Because you'll see another thought, another thing was getting into their natural man. There's a natural man. I, I sort of liken it a little bit to a single man when he gets married. Ooh. Very different way of living. <laughs> I'm not going too far, but I did not realize that it was a big thing to, to leave the toilet lit up. I didn't realize that, you know, leaving your undies on the floor and everything like that, because mom used to pick them up. <laughs> so it's a, it's a whole new way of living. And, and, and I found out that if I didn't start to change, I won't go any further. Amen? So I learned to change. Romans 8, I believe, explains a lot to us, and I'd like you to have a look with me in Romans 8. Amazing. How many people are glad that we've got this book? All these things are written for our examples and wants to reveal stuff to us. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now that sounds very, very easy, but when you've been in the world and unsaved for 27 years and then you get born again and you come into church and the Spirit of God starts working with you, you don't understand what's going on. Because somehow or other you've got yourself into a, into a state, this is how I live, this is how I do things. But then now God says, no, I don't want you to do it like that. I've got a whole new plan for your life. And I found that there was a war raging on the inside of me. Things that I wanted to do, I didn't do. And so forth. It says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his only son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal man is, is at enmity against God. For is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. 
And it goes on to say different things though. It goes on to, 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 but we're not of this flesh. We're born of the Spirit. So we've been born of the Spirit. So we need to learn how to walk in this new realm, in this realm of the Spirit. You see, God really knows what we fight. It's not always the devil. Most times it's our flesh. Anybody else here this morning? How about we shut our eyes, and tell the truth, and shame the devil? How many people have trouble with your flesh? I'm not looking. I got my eyes tight as tight as I tight. I can, but I can feel the fan <laughs> of, the, of the hands. See, our spirit man loves to please God. We sing praises and and we worship Him and and we really really want to serve Him. But our flesh man or our carnal man does not understand and does not want to change. I didn't want to have to change. I've left a toilet lid up, lit up for 27 years. and No, it wasn't that long, was it? It was 20 years. This morning, she said, Neil, you've got a part in your hair. <laughs> Down the middle. I said, that's the way it wants to go. <laughs> My hair has got a mind of its own. Some of you don't have that problem. <laughs> that our flesh man or carnal man does not understand our, uh, 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 sorry, the things of the Spirit that caused us to change. You see, that's why some people that are born again for years still have anger problems, still have problems with lust, addictions, still have Problem putting the toilet seat down. But you see, Jesus wants to set us free. He wants to give us power and victory. He, I believe He wants to reveal His power and ability to help us to transcend into His kingdom. He showed Himself very, very strong. It wasn't too long after He, he met uh, Peter he goes to Peter and, and says, can I use your boat to preach? He goes out a little bit from the shore and he starts to preach. When he, fi when he finishes preaching, he says to the guys, have you caught any fish? They said, no, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. He said, well, just launch out in the deep a little bit. They've already cleaned their nets. They've already finished for the day. A lot of times when God wants to get to us and we say, oh God, I've tried that or I've done that or I'm too tired now or, or I don't feel like it right now. Until we let God have his way in our lives, we'll never go to the next level. We'll never go to where God really wants us to go. We'll never see God in all his power. We'll never see what he wants to impart into your life. You'll never see the victory. And so these guys, they, they say, oh, nevertheless, that your word will do it. And so they launch out in the deep, and obviously the, their nets begin to break. And they call for another boat, and they fill two boats up with fish. And they look at each other, and they think, man, that's, this is amazing. What, what is Jesus trying to do? He's trying to break the stronghold of the natural mind. Most probably where they fished, they most probably would have rowed for hours to get to the spot. There's favorite spot. But where Jesus told them to fish is right where they were, right beside the bank. I don't want to tell you this, friend. You can go here and you can go out there looking for this and looking for that. But I want to tell you, your miracle is nigh thee, even in your mouth. The answer is closer than you think. And sometimes it seems so obscure to us. And we're going, we run here and we run there and we're looking for this and we're looking for that and we go here and there. But I want to tell you, Jesus said, I'm right beside you. I'll never ever leave you nor forsake you. You get a hold of Jesus and I want to tell you, he'll show himself to you. He'll make room for you. He'll make a way for you. And so God, I find with Jesus, is always trying to, to, to show who he is. I want to say to you today, 
Welcome to the school of the Spirit. Welcome to a school. You mightn't get a diploma, but I want to tell you it's happening all around your life right now. It's either the school of the Spirit or the school of hard knocks. Once you are born again, you enter in to the school of the Spirit, whether you want to or not. Turn to somebody and say, whether I wanted to or not, I'm in. <laughs> see, see we, can, we, can just do, we can just do church. We can just have a nice, little, happy, or else we realize that you've been saved for a purpose. You've been called out. You've been taken out to be brought into. God wants to put His anointing over your life. He wants those words that He says, these things that I do, you can do also. He wants those words to become real to you that you can lay hands on the sick and that they will recover. He wants you to understand that the power of God resides in you now and that you can pray for people and you've got a voice, that the anointing is there. You can go and talk to people. We're no longer slaves to fear. We're no longer slaves to, to whatever stops us. God wants to deliver us. He wants to set us free. He wants to release us. So you're in the school of the Spirit whether you want to or not. If you don't realize that your natural mind will fight subconsciously what the Spirit of God wants to do in your life. Jesus wants to set us free and take you to a place in Him a place of liberty and freedom, power and victory. I'm going to read some scriptures to you this morning and some of the things that I spoke about last week down in the book of Mark. Mark chapter 4. I don't hear the rustling of pages. <laughs> and, and there was stories there. This story is written for our example. It's written to help us. We know that Jesus starts with these boys and they're going to go to the other side and they're full of fear. Don't you care? We're perishing. And Jesus had to say to them, Why are you so fearful and have no faith? Then in Mark 5 verse 34, Jesus said something there that would have astounded them. And sometimes in us, we gloss over things and we don't realize it. We don't really see many times what Jesus wants us to see. This book is written because God wants to reveal stuff to us. He wants to show us stuff. Mark 5 verse 34, Jesus there and we know that is that on his way to Jairus' house and there's a woman who had an issue of blood. And this woman said these words. She said, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. This woman had suffered for years after years, 12 years, with an issue of blood. She spent all of her money. She, instead of getting better, she's now worse. She's unclean. She's pushed outside the camp. But now all of a sudden she gets something on the inside of her that says, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. And she had to push through and she had to break strongholds. This woman would have mostly have been a wealthy woman. She would have been a woman with, that had servants perhaps before. She would have been a woman of, of something. Wasn't used to begging. Wasn't used to getting on her knees. Wasn't used to being told, get out of here. You're, you're no good. You'll never, you, you, whatever it is. I don't know how many times I'd heard that story. Get out. You're no good. You'll never make it. You're not educated. You're not this. You're not that. Most of these, these words come from somebody that loves you or, you or somebody that you love. And you carry them and you take them on board. And this woman would have, over 12 years, would have just lost all of her substance, everything. But now she's coming in there. I'm going to touch the hem of his garment. I really don't care what people think. I want to touch the hem of his garment. 
and the disciples were there and they were most probably pushing this woman away. This one that had just said to them before, uh, how come you've got no faith? How come you're full of fear? This woman wasn't fearful. She was relentless. She was going after God. Friend, I want to tell you, I believe that God's looking for a bunch of people that will go after Him. It doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter what people think. It doesn't matter what people do. What matters right now is you and your Lord, whether you want to go after Him or whether you're going to let the crowd push you back. Popular opinion, whatever it might be. She goes in there relentless. I'm going to touch the hem of His garment. The disciples would have been pushing them back. And all of a sudden, Jesus stops in the midst and He says, Who touched me? That's very obvious here because the disciples said, There's a crowd thronging you. There's a crowd thronging you and you, and everybody's touching you. See, friend, a lot of people can be going to church this morning, but how many people are really touching Jesus? How many are you going for wrong reasons, wrong attitudes, wrong things? How many people really want Jesus? How many people really want to touch Him? Friend, I want to tell you in our worship, if we don't, if we don't shake ourselves a little bit and push through embarrassment and negativity, whatever else, and lift up your hands and sing and worship the King, we won't make it either. Touch the hem. Oh, everybody's touching you. It's just a trick question. But you see, when you touch Jesus, virtue flows out of him. It's not just a matter of having a little touch and it's a nice little thing. No, Jesus wants to impart himself into you. He wants to heal your body. He wants to break the brokenness. He wants to destroy all that the enemy wants a plan for your life. Virtue flowed out of him and the woman was immediately healed. Jesus said, who touched me? The woman fearing in herself said, I touched you. And Jesus said these words that would have shocked the, the, every disciple. He said, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Oh, no, Jesus, you did it. You, you healed them. Yes, we know that. Yes, we know who healed them. We know who the healer is. But just listen to this. Your faith, your faith. Your faith has made me whole, has made you whole. I don't know where I am here. I'm all over the place. 34. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed. Not, not you, Jesus, but faith in Jesus made her whole. Faith heals. There's something that God wants to do in our lives to cause faith again to rise within us. We need to look at things differently. That's what Jesus was doing with his disciples. He was messing with their mind. What he's doing in lives right now, in 2019, the same Jesus that took those disciples on a boat ride that would have thought, smashed every preconceived ideas that they'd ever had about religion, about Him, about life, and started to open up the supernatural realm to them. Started to reveal who was really in their midst. And if ever I believe that the church right now in 2019 needs is a fresh revelation of who is really in our midst. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the Savior of the world. Amen. Daughter, your faith has made you well. We do need to look at things differently. The school of the Spirit. Things of the Spirit are caught, not taught. They're caught by revelation. 
They're not taught by doctrine, flesh, mind, logic. I believe that true doctrine is very, very important. True doctrines and philosophies and things of God are very, very important. But in Ephesians 4.14 it says, not to be tossed around by every wind of doctrine. That's the sort of thing that I'm talking about. Today we're living in, a, in an hour when there's so many opinions, so many thoughts, so much, so much, I don't know what's going on sometimes. People will want to fight you over, over doctrine, over things there that, that I don't know, I don't know the answer. I have a little bit of a joke that I have in my own mind many times when, when I hear people with, with their doctrines, end times and goodness knows what else. I see the Father, Son and the Holy Ghost up in heaven looking down at earth, listening to some of these conversations. And the Father says to the Son, I didn't know that, did you? <laughs> Is that why we did that? Sounds a good idea. Friend, love Jesus. Just love Jesus. Amen. Ask Him to come in and take you. Ask the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you into all truth. He'll lead us. And how many people believe that that's His job? I find myself saying, hey, Holy Ghost, that's your job. <laughs> you teach me. You show me. You show me. In Luke 8, 18, 8, it says this. It says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Will he really find faith? Mark 4, 40 again. Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Or how is it that you still have no faith? Some Christians don't have faith in finance. And they, they withhold. They don't give. I believe that God loves a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. It's an interesting thing, but faith and trust gets God's attention. There's certain things that get God's attention. A little woman that put two mites in the offering got God's attention. He saw the her heart. God's watching. He's, he's watching over planet Earth. He's watching over His Word. He's watching. He's watching. A never-ending watching. How is it just have no faith? Faith. Trust get God's, gets God's attention. In Matthew 8, chapter, uh, verse 5, we read the story of the centurion. And the centurion came to him and, and said, My servant is, is paralyzed and, and really needs some help, and goodness knows what. And Jesus said, I'll come. And all of a sudden he said, Hey, woo, 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 woo. You don't have to come. I understand something, I understand authority. You don't have to come because I just tell this one to come and he comes and I tell him to go and he goes. And all you got to do is send your word. You know what he said? Jesus said to him, he said, I have not seen such great faith. Not in all of his life. See, there's things today that, that gives God, get, gets God's attention. There's, there's things about your life today that will get God's attention that'll take you to another place, that'll take you to another level. Because you see, that's what God wants to do with us. He just doesn't want us like frogs sitting on a log. I'm a large-mouthed frog. And the bird came up and said, I eat large-mouthed frogs. You don't say so. <laughs> Learn to change quick. <laughs> I 
Hmm. Hallelujah. Anybody getting anything out of this? Rats, <laughs> mouth, frogs, man, where's he gone? You see, the Lord will put things in our journey, not bad things, but to help us find him. Find him in reality. Find out who he really is. You don't have to worry, I'm not going to get too long. When Jesus said in Mark 4.35, let us cross over to the other side, he wanted to reveal himself to them, but he also wanted to see where they were at. How many people know that God wants to know where you're at? Hmm? Oh, Lord, I want a healing ministry. I couldn't give it to you. Why not? Because you're full of pride. It would destroy you. I want to see where you're at. Because, see, he had big plans for these boys, okay? And he could have just did it on that, hey, there it is, whack. No. He had to reveal some things. He had to show some things. He had to knock some things out of them. You're looking at me very strange. He had to break down some strongholds. He had to put some things aside. I believe in 2019, he wants to know where we are at. I don't believe that for one moment that Jesus, when he spoke to those fellows, and said, let's go over the other side, I believe he knew that there was a storm that was going to brew. I believe he knew that there was Gadarean maniac on the beach not far away. I believe he knew that. But I don't believe for one minute that he really expected those boys to stand up in that boat when they saw that wind and Jesus was asleep on the pillow. I don't believe that he expected them to stand up and say, Be still. Be calm. I don't really think he expected that. But what I do believe that he expected. And I don't know about you, but if you're in the school of the Spirit, you've been there, you've been there, you've been exactly where I'm going to describe right now. I expected, I believed that what he was looking for was to see those boys in the boat, drenched, <laughs> bailing, <laughs> rowing, <laughs> believing, mullet sticking out of the pocket. <laughs> seaweed on their head hit the other side and Jesus would have stood up and looked at the boys and they would have said, man, man, I've never been on a ride like that before in my life. I've been in the sea a lot of times. I know the ocean, but my goodness, I want to tell you, those waves were boisterous. Those waves are so powerful. They were pounding in the boat. And we had to work. We had to bail. We had to do this. We rode. But I want to tell you, we made it. Hallelujah. We made it to the other side because you were in the boat with me. And because you said we were going over the other side. And he would have just said to him, good on you boys. Well done. But instead he had to say, how come you're so fearful? And you've got no faith. Then he finds a, a girl and says, your faith has made you well. And my goodness, we're going to Jairus' house now. That's another thing. Jairus is a, a religious leader. Man, he, he's likely to take our heads off. He's likely to throw us all in prison. He's got the power to do that. Jairus. And so he comes up there and, and while they're walking down the road, while they're walking down the road, Towards Jairus' house, somebody from Jairus' house comes and says, Don't trouble the master anymore. Your daughter is dead. Jesus said, Don't fear, 
only believe. But I want to tell you his eyes were going over the twelve. His eyes were going over them. He would have been looking at Thomas and Thomas would have been looking like a ghost. <laughs> Praise God Thomas didn't stay a doubter. Amen? He became a mighty man of God. The others there would have been terrified. But I believe that he looked at Peter, James and John and he saw a flicker in their eye. He saw something inside of those... Friend, can I say this again? God's eyes are going to and fro, watching and looking for people of faith, people that He can trust, people that He can put His mantle on, people that He can put His anointing on, people that He can put His word in, put, give you gifts or whatever it is, motivate you. I don't know what it is, but I want to tell you, God's going to raise up a mighty army. He's going to have a people there that know Him and know the power of His resurrection that are going to go forth and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. And he said to the rest, he said, you boys stay here. Peter, James, John, you come with me. And they would have walked in there with Jesus. They heard the cries, the turmoil. The, the, they had the, all the, 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 what do you call it, the paid uh, mourners. They were there doing their mourning thing and everything was going on. Jesus put them out and he said, he made the statement. He said, she's not dead, she is asleep. And they laughed in the school. You know what? People might look at us. They might say that motley bunch. They might laugh at us. I don't care what they do. All I know is that there's a passion that's beginning to stir in us. A passion for Him. Amen. A passion. A passion. A passion. A passion. Pushes them out. They walk in. Oh, if I was one of those Peter, James, and John, I would have first thing I would have looked at that little girl's belly and see if it was going up and down or not. Can you imagine? Can you imagine as they walked in that room? Mum, Dad, Jesus, and all his power, and all his authority. Anointing, presence of Almighty God, as He walked into death, and death had departed its way. Death had departed its way as He walked in. Peter, James, and John followed. As He walked over to that little girl, He started to speak to her. And then He put down His hand, and He says, "Arise." would have watched that little girl's eyes open. I tell you what, friends, the atmosphere. Some people say you don't need atmosphere. I believe you need atmosphere. The atmosphere. Life surging into that little girl. And she began to stand. They took her by the hand. And as they took her by the hand, mum and dad. Tears rolling down his rusty face. Mum, so full of praise and adoration. Worshipping, loving, thanking God. Friend, this is, this is church. Worshipping, loving. Peter, James and John in that atmosphere. Presence of God. Took the little girl out, says, give him something. Can you imagine as they opened the flap of that tent or whatever it was, and as they took that little girl out there, the roar. Peter, James, and John were standing there in awe. In awe. The rest of the disciples by now would have gathered around and what, what, happened, what happened? You know what? There's times in your life there's times when you get into the presence of God. There's times when you see 
and sense the hand of God touching you, healing you, delivering you. And those boys would have got around Peter, James, and John and said, What happened? What happened? And I would imagine they would have just looked and they would have said, We should have been. We should have been. And so I don't have words to express. I don't have words that can express what it was like. You just should have been there. I believe that God wants to take us on a journey into His presence. I believe the next move of God is going to be His glory. We're going to see His glory. What I'm sensing right now is but a glimpse of what He wants to do in our lives. Do you want to go with Him? Do you want to be on that journey with Him into His glory? Father, I ask you today, I cannot have an altar call. It's already been done. We're already on the altar. And I pray, my God, that people would just open up their hearts and let the King of glory come in. Oh, God. I'm going to continue with this when I come back. So I believe that God is preparing His church. How many people believe that? And that's us, amen? That's us. I could ask you to make a decision this morning that it might last for until you get to the car park. But if the Holy Spirit puts on your life and you make a pact with Him, it's a different thing. Amen. And that's all I'm asking you to do. That last song we sang from, from today, what was that? I need you more. I need you more. I'll pray for people if you need healing. I, I felt this today that there's somebody here and you've got a condition in your left shoulder and uh, the pain goes up into your, into your the side of your neck, up into that area, left shoulder, up into your neck. That's you. I'd, I'd like to pray for you. If there's anybody else that just needs prayer for something. Uh, but I'm not trying to get you to make a decision. To... <sighs> You're already in the school of the Spirit. Come on, let's, let's just stand around. Here. You got that on your neck? It's going to go, Camille. It's going to go. I want you just to start to lift up that hand. Lift it up. Lift it up, 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 lift it up. Loosen her. How's that feel? Hey? It's better. Amen. Amen. Now, Father, let your presence come down. Holy Ghost. I need you more, Lord. I need you more. You need prayer for something? I need you more. More than words today. I need you more. More than words can say. I need you more. Hey. 